The sitting is resumed. It's time for questions to the Minister of Finance and Personnel. We will start with listed questions. Question three has been withdrawn, and I call Mr. Kieran McCarthy. Mr. McCarthy. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker. Question one to the Minister. Minister. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Accruing resources is the term used to refer to the income received by a department which it is authorised to retain to offset related expenditure rather than surrender to the Northern Ireland Consolidated Fund. The limits for such income are voted by the Assembly in the budget bills associated with the main and spring supplementary estimates. Mr. McCarthy for supplement. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I am grateful to the Minister for her response. But will the Minister confirm that the prospect of a senior civil servant setting a budget at the end of July would be catastrophic for our public services? And rather than so called phantom budget, the only sensible uh, and a responsible thing to do is for every party in this Assembly to support a real budget that will balance our books and also provide Could continuation a question, of a half please. decent service to our population. Thank you. Well, thank you uh, for the supplementary. And uh, indeed, it would be, uh, to use his words, catastrophic if we had to uh, go into a situation where the Permanent Secretary of DFP uh, had to act under Section 59 of the Northern Ireland Act. That would be absolutely catastrophic for um, the Northern Ireland public uh, because of the cuts that would have to be made uh, to public services. I have heard the uh, budget that I have circulated uh, to executive colleagues and indeed the committee now, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, being described in various ways. Uh, a fantasy budget, a phantom budget, whatever uh, it is that the BBC deems to call it at that particular time. Uh, but in actual fact, the budget I am bringing forward uh, is a budget that is based on the full implementation of the Stormont House Agreement. Therefore, those people who are not standing by the Stormont House Agreement which have to look at themselves and ask themselves why they are not standing by their commitments uh, in the Stormont House Agreement. Uh, because to do otherwise will cause grave difficulties to public services in Northern Ireland. And there are two choices uh, if the budget goes ahead. Either the Westminster Government uh, will have to implement welfare reform, or those who have turned their face against welfare reform will have to deal with it. Those are the choices ahead of us. Mr Ian McRae. Thank you, Speaker. And, uh, I can only but echo the, the Minister's comments in respect of um, ensuring that the Stormont House agreement and the budget that um, comes out of that is implemented. But given, and the Minister will be aware, that the um, people within the rural community are concerned in respect of single farm payments, can the Minister provide any detail as to how that will be resolved and payments will be made um, if this bu budget process isn't completed? Well, obviously, EU funding, including uh, the single farm payment, uh, is provided for specific reasons, and we will do uh, everything within our power to ensure that that funding goes to the intended recipients. Um, and with the progression of the budget bill, as I said, I've already shared it with executive colleagues and with uh, the committee. Uh, with the progression of that budget bill, uh, I anticipate that the, the payments will continue uh, as normal. Uh, if the budget bill uh, should be rejected, however, um, I, I am taking steps and I am confident uh, that the single farm payment will be paid, though possibly not through uh, the normal processes. I want to ensure that farmers are in receipt of their single farm payment because I know uh, how important that single farm payment is to the rural community. Call Mr. Dominic Bradley. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, is the Minister aware that other um, legal advice in respect of the spending of uh, green resources runs contrary to the view that she has expressed? Uh, well, yes, I have received correspondence uh, from the committee. I have uh, studied uh, that correspondence, as you would expect me to do. Uh, and I have to say it is not, uh, uh, in, in, it does not lie alongside the very clear uh, legal advice which I have, which indicates that I have uh, and the department has no legal power uh, to set accruing resource limits in the absence of an appropriate limit, uh, and that appropriate limit is set by the Budget Act. 
um, and uh, the committee letter does not in any way negate the legal advice uh, which I have received. And I'm quite content to have a conversation with uh, either uh, himself as vice chair or indeed with the, with the chair in relation to that legal advice. But as far as I can see, the legal advice does not negate the very clear legal advice which I have received. Mr. Jim Allist. Has the Minister yet met the Treasury to discuss the budget mayhem? And when she does, uh, will she deal with the issue of how she can possibly set a budget with a 604 million black hole without setting herself on a course of breaching Treasury constraints? Well, uh, I thank the member for his question. As he knows probably from public commentary, uh, I have asked for uh, a meeting with Her Majesty's Treasury. Uh, that meeting was to take place on Thursday of this week and unfortunately uh, clashes uh, with the executive meeting, so I won't be able to go uh, to that Treasury meeting, but I've asked for uh, another date as quickly as possible uh, to discuss uh, the issues that we find ourselves in. In, in relation to breaching uh, our controls, um, I'm bringing this budget forward on the premise that the whole of the Stormont House Agreement will be implemented, not parts of it, but all of it. Uh, and therefore, if all of it uh, does come to fruition, then the budget will not have a whole of 604 million. Sandra Overend for a question. Thank you. Question two, please. And with your permission, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I would like to answer questions two. 11 and 12 together as they all relate to the Northern Ireland Civil Service Voluntary Exit Scheme. In her St Patrick's Day speech, the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland said, all the other elements of the Stormont House Agreement would fail if the welfare aspects are not implemented. The Voluntary Exit Scheme and the £700 million required to fund it are key elements of the Stormont House Agreement, so at present we are unable to access this funding. This has significant implications for the executive's budget, uh, the budgets of public sector bodies, and importantly, the individuals affected. Well, Mrs. Over in for supplementary. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I agree it is um, it's a worrying time for, for those that have applied and are still uh, still have yet not uh, got confirmation. Uh, of, of, the, of their future. Um, can the Minister maybe outline uh, for every month of the delay um, on the agreement or finalisation of the voluntary exit scheme, how much is it costing the executive? Well, there are two aspects to the voluntary exit scheme. Uh, obviously, we have been allocated under the Stormont House Agreement £700 million to deal with the scheme to allow us to uh, allow people to apply in uh, to the scheme. Uh, as uh, she will know, uh, over 7,200 people applied from the civil service into the scheme. And uh, the head of the civil service has now sent out, uh, in the first tranche, uh, conditional letters to 1,200 people. Um, so they have received conditional letters which indicate uh, th their offer and uh, that they could leave at the end of September, but that that is conditional upon us being able to access the £200 million uh, for this year. And it's important um, that those people are allowed to leave in a timely manner because departments have factored in savings uh, from their pay bills uh, from those people leaving. And I don't have the specifics for each of the departments in front of me, but each department has factored in into their savings plan uh, a particular amount of money, uh, allowing those people to move on, and then the pay bill reductions are coming into their savings plan. So it's a, it has two sides to it, uh, but it is very important that we are able to proceed with the voluntary exit scheme. Well, Mr. Jimmy Spratt. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. And can I ask the Minister, in relation to the voluntary exit scheme, uh, can I ask her what level of uh, interest has there been from the Northern Ireland Civil Service? And indeed, uh, is the uh, scheme oversubscribed? Well, as I've indicated, at the closure of the NICS scheme, 7,285 individuals applied uh, to be considered uh, for selection. Uh, all departments provided a, a profile of the numbers of staff by grade and discipline that they require to exit under the scheme in order to achieve uh, the required pay bill savings. And not all of the applicants were selected, uh, and so we anticipate 
um, that they uh, that not and indeed we anticipate that not all of those selected uh, will choose to leave. They may decide no, we're going to stay on and work, and so it's um, not necessarily the case that all 1,200 of those people uh, will leave. So at this stage, it's not possible to say whether the scheme uh, is oversubscribed. We will know more later on in the year. Mr. Alex Easton. Um, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister what other funding is dependent about this, uh, upon the Stormont House Agreement being implemented? Well, in addition to the loss of the 700 million RRI borrowing for the voluntary exit scheme, we will also lose 150 million pounds of funding over five years. Um, that's to pay for institutions to help deal with the past, and we all know how important it is to try and deal with those very difficult issues uh, of the past. Uh, 500 million over 10 years for capital projects to support shared and integrated uh, education projects. We will also lose certain flexibilities agreed in relation to this year's budget, um, and uh, those are in relation to the scope to repay the £100 million loan, uh, which we took out for last year in 1415. From we were taking the repayments from capital uh, receipts and from capital budgets, and then we will have to pay the full year cost of not implementing welfare reform, £114 million, uh, and lose the flexibility. Uh, to repay this from the capital budget. So very significant issues and very significant funding is dependent on the full implementation of the Stormont House Agreement. Call Mr. Colm Eastwood. Thank you, Mr. Can I thank the, the Minister for her answer thus far. Can I ask her uh, what criteria has been used to determine eligibility for people uh, applying for the, for, the, for the voluntary exit scheme? Is it just based around uh, finances or, or is there a consideration given to departmental needs? So it's uh, not just about that when they were determining their uh, departmental savings, they will have looked at their, their business needs moving into the future. So business needs uh, is very much part of the selection in terms of who has been selected for this first tranche. And as I've said, uh, staff were, uh, de departments provided a profile of their staff in terms of numbers of staff, their grades, their disciplines. So what we don't want to see happening is that a, a particular skill is completely lost to the civil service because everybody is left under the voluntary exit scheme. And we've seen that happen uh, in other organisations when there have been schemes uh, that have come forward. So it's very important that the civil service continues to run in a business-like fashion. Mr. John McAllister. And thank you, Deputy Speaker. Could I ask the Minister, can she confirm that had she put a recruitment freeze on the civil service four years ago, we wouldn't have needed a voluntary exit scheme and thus could have used 700 million of borrowing in, in other more useful areas? And would she care to say which parties she thinks in this chamber still support the Stormont House Agreement in full? Well, when I attend meetings uh, in relation to the Stormont House Agreement, I'm told that all the parties in this House support the Stormont House Agreement. Now, of course, it's for others to determine whether that's right or wrong, um, but uh, I certainly know, I certainly know uh, that the party that I represent uh, fully wants to see the implementation of the Stormont House Agreement. And I say that because it is a balanced agreement. You cannot have one part of it implemented and not the rest of it implemented. It has to be implemented in full because it was a balanced agreement that took some considerable time uh, to reach. Uh, in relation to his other uh, issue, I'm afraid I wasn't in post four years ago, as I think he realises. Uh, so I will check back with the Minister for Finance then as to what he believes is the case. Well, Mr Barry Michael Duff for a question. Question number four, Cash de Vricar. The revaluation is a long overdue correction and a help to many businesses who have been facing difficulty. Sectors and locations have not performed well since the last revaluation 12 years ago are now paying less. Conversely, those that have fared better are paying more. The revaluation is informed by the property market and we are not raising more money from it. However, should the correction present individual businesses with excessive financial pressures, then I would encourage them to speak with LPS regarding the possibility of a payment arrangement. Michael Duff for supplement. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. Um, can I ask the Minister if there's anything that she can do 
her and her department to assist those businesses for which the revaluation exercise could become a tipping point, forcing them to lay off employees or even close their doors. And I'm thinking about a number of small rural towns in West Tyrone where it appears that local businesses have been hammered. One business in the Carrickmore area has seen a raise of 618%. Can we have a question? Oh. Well, uh, I will say to the member that the results across Northern Ireland are very much uh, as expected. There may be individual businesses, and he's made reference to one uh, that stand out, but it is a correction. And uh, if he uh, was watching television last week, he would have seen a report on Belfast City Centre and how the correction has really helped bring in um, developers into the city centre because of the fact that the rates were much too high uh, in the past and that a revaluation was needed. And I accept what he's saying in relation to the scale of the increase in terms of percentages, but in, if you look at the real value in terms of the rates that they are paying, uh, it will be, I would say, um, tens of times lower than in other places uh, in Northern Ireland. And therefore, the revaluation did need to occur. I think it was the right thing uh, to happen. I have said before that I am happy to speak to members about individual cases that uh, are at either end of the scale, if you like, in terms of uh, the differences that have been made to them. But I think in terms of the uh, reliefs uh, that we already provide. We do provide uh, a wide range of, release, uh, of re uh, reliefs, uh, particularly to the non-domestic uh, sector, and, and so those should be looked at. But I do also say to him that the executive has frozen the regional rate, uh, and because of the revaluation exercise, actually, uh, the regional rate has reduced. Uh, were that the case uh, with the district rate? And in many cases, uh, council areas have indeed increased the, uh, the uh, district rate uh, and haven't kept to the very prudent uh, exercise which the executive have been involved in. Well, Mr. Gary Middleton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the minister for her answers this far? Uh, can the minister outline uh, what she's doing to support the ratepayers who are adversely affected uh, by the revaluation? Well, as I've indicated, we have a wide range uh, of reliefs uh, available uh, in Northern Ireland to support ratepayers, despite, and we all know that it's a, a shrinking uh, public purse uh, available to us, uh, and indeed a package of support worth up to £30 million has been seen the impact of rates convergence uh, effectively removed for any business ratepayer uh, through an 80% subsidy uh, on this particular year. We have small business uh, rate relief still in existence, empty shops rates concession, industrial derating uh, and an exemption for rural ATMs have all been extended uh, for this financial year in 15-16 at a time um, when we are under significant pressures in relation uh, to our funding. Uh, and I would ask members that when they're asking for rate reliefs um, to come forward to recall that we have a fixed amount of money and if we are going to give rate relief um, in terms of businesses or rural businesses or whatever it is to be, uh, then we have to find the money for that. And already we have great constraints uh, from our central government departments and we need to bear that in mind. Well, Ms. Claire Sugden. Uh, Deputy Speaker, um, can I ask the Minister if she's aware of how many successful appeals against the net annual value there have been, and does that suggest that the revaluation process in itself was flawed? Well, I don't have the precise figures in front of me. Um, the draft uh, rate went out, I think, in November uh, of last year, uh, and there have been a number of appeals since then, but there are many appeals still to be heard, and indeed there are over, I think, uh, a thousand appeals in and I would encourage uh, anyone who is not content in terms of uh, uh, the rates that have been set to appeal. I mean I don't take it uh, in any way uh, as, uh, as an error in terms of the revaluation to see appeals coming forward. I think it's actually testing uh, the system to see what happens because this is evidence-based and in many cases some of the forms that were sent out uh, to rates payers for evidence before the rates were set were not actually returned and therefore the evidence may not have been available uh, and I think if there is evidence available that wasn't taken into consideration then they should be bringing it forward. Well, Mr. Leslie Cree. Deputy Speaker, the Minister will be aware that um, there are many uh, types of business which have been affected quite dramatically, one of them being petrol forecourts. 
Um, I know my question really was based on the, uh, the amount of the uh, appeals which have been lodged, but is there any trend emerging from those appeals to suggest, bearing in mind it's a zero-sum game, that somehow those particular forms of business are suffering more adversely than some of the others? I think it's a little bit too early to, um, to say whether there's a trend in terms of a, a particular sector or, or not, but certainly I am aware uh, at a constituency level uh, of the petrol four courts issue, uh, and I understand there may be uh, even a class action taken uh, in respect of their shops. Um, I'm hoping to, I've already met with those people at a constituency level, uh, and I may well meet again uh, with them uh, at, uh, now that I am Minister for Finance, I wasn't Minister for Finance at the time, um, to discuss with them where their concerns lie, because I think um, it is important that we are as transparent as we possibly can be, Deputy Speaker, in relation to all of this. Where are the comparators? How did we arrive at that particular rateable valuation? I think it is important, and we owe it to uh, our constituents and indeed to businesses to allow them to find the answers to those issues. Mr. Ian Milne for a question. Uh, Kester Craig, question number five. Uh, of course, it is important to work with other administrations in areas of mutual concern and where best practice can be shared. My officials are in regular contact with their Scottish counterparts with respect to a broad range of matters relevant to the work of my department. Mr. Milne for a supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for answer thus far. Minister, following the, the recent visit of the Finance and Personnel uh, Committee to Scotland, it is, it is widely uh, perceived that the Scottish Executive has a much more robust, robust uh, approach uh, in dealing with the Treasury in London than the one here, in, our, in the Department here. Does the Minister believe it is time to step up her demands for a fair deal for, um, from London? Well, I'm, I'm very pleased to hear the member use the term fair deal because, of course, that was a DUP slogan uh, not so long ago uh, that we would deliver a, a fair deal. That we would deliver a fair deal. That, that we would deliver, and I hear it didn't go down well for some members exactly, uh, that we did deliver a fair deal uh, for uh, Northern Ireland. In terms of meeting with Scottish uh, ministers, I've very recently received, uh, just since my appointment, uh, correspondence from uh, my counterpart John Swinney, MSP, the Scottish Deputy First Minister and Cabinet Secretary for Finance. Uh, I very much look forward uh, to meeting with John again. Um, I have met with him uh, in my previous roles so that we can discuss issues of mutual interest, including, I have to say, public sector reform. And uh, also, uh, I'm looking forward to meeting with the Welsh Finance Minister as well. She has also been in contact. So we do look forward to a trilateral uh, with those two ministers, but I'll probably be meeting John as well on an individual uh, basis. Oh, Mr. Roy Beggs. Deputy Speaker, I recall a number of years ago when a member of the Finance Committee that there was a new budget process being uh, arranged which ultimately was, uh, which would improve um, transparency and adopt the best practice, uh, but that was ultimately blocked by Sinn Féin ministers. So I find it rather strange this question being placed by, by them. But could the minister advise what actions she has taken to ensure that we actually have a real budget and apart from that to ensure that we have a better process such as was previously approved by the Finance Committee and indeed this Assembly? Can I say to the member, I think he's absolutely right to call for more transparency in relation to departmental budgets. I think that's what committees need to see. I actually think it's what uh, the public need to be aware of as well. And I, think he, and I am now actually engaged uh, in a process as to how we can do that. How can we make, um, dare I say it, the Northern Ireland finances more accessible uh, to people in uh, the public? So I, have, I am engaging in that process and I very much want to be able to do that. As regards the budget, um, I believe uh, it is a real budget, uh, and I say that because the budget was agreed on figures that were agreed back in the 23rd of December under the Stormont House Agreement. That's the process under which I am bringing this budget forward on, and uh, whether it's through Sinn Féin and the STLP stepping up to the mark in relation to welfare, or whether it's through the Westminster Government uh, taking the action to deal with welfare, those are the options, but as far as I'm concerned, I'm fulfilling my responsibility to bring forward a budget when it comes to the House next week. Mr. Ross Hussey is not in his place. 
I call Ms. Meave McLaughlin. Well, good, uh, question number seven. I plan to introduce the Social Innovation Fund in the 2015-16 financial year. A consultation will issue shortly inviting views on, amongst other issues, the spending priority and the distribution mechanism for the Social Innovation Fund. Subject to the outcome of the consultation exercise, the Northern Ireland spending priorities will be subject to the draft affirmative resolution procedure in the Assembly. Ms. McLaughlin for supplementary. Well, I thank the Minister for her response. But can I ask the Minister in relation to the consultation process, is it likely that that would include feedback um, from, you know, in terms of topping up funds from additional contributions from trusts or sponsors who would be supportive of the peace process? Carmen. I think we'll be wanting uh, any organisation that think that they can help uh, with this fund to become involved in the consultation. As I say, uh, any definitive uh, programme will be laid before the House in terms of affirmative resolution, so the House will also have its role in relation uh, to the fund. This is a, a good opportunity, in particular for those organisations that perhaps don't feel that they can apply into the big lottery. Uh, to be able to access funding for their organisations, and I very much welcome that, and I know that that will be welcomed uh, in the general uh, third sector. Mr. Pat Ramsey. Yes, yeah, certainly, Minister, the SDLP would warmly welcome uh, this particular project that you're, you're aiming to introduce innovation of it. Could, as, although at an early stage, could the Minister outline what type of social enterprise projects are likely to succeed or entitled to get funding from this? Well, I think it was my predecessor who decided to widen the scheme out to the wider social uh, economy, and I think that, that is absolutely the right thing to do. We don't want to limit the access uh, for those involved in the third sector, particularly at a time uh, when they may be facing constraints uh, from other areas of government, let's be, let's be honest about it. Um, so the main benefit of the, the scheme is that it will give access to funding um, to organisations such as social enterprises who wish to invest in their activities but until now have been unable to access that money, uh, whether through loans or grants. So I think it will be broadly welcomed by the third sector, and I very much look forward to bringing it to the House. I call Mr Jonathan Craig. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, thank the Minister for answers so far. Can the Minister outline what the exact purpose of this fund for? Because I'm, I'm assuming this is not to substitute existing uh, schemes that are out there. Oh, absolutely not. This is to, to be an additional uh, scheme, and it will not form part of public spending. So I think that's why it certainly will be welcomed, um, not just by the third sector, but everyone uh, in the assembly should welcome this as an additional source of money for that particular sector. Uh, so. It isn't a substitute for mainstream government spending. It's an additional uh, source of funding, uh, probably through loans, uh, although I don't want to preempt uh, the consultation, through loans so that they can proceed and to develop their particular social enterprise. Call Mr. Chris Hazard. I'm last going to call your question number eight. The Northern Ireland Composite Economic Index provides information on the state of the Northern Ireland economy and as such may be used alongside the other data to assist the executive in determining its priorities. The Minister will be aware that the indicator was flat in three out of the last four quarters. Uh, how do you propose to drive sustainable economic recovery, Minister Gormilgut? The member will have seen the PMI for this week, uh, which looks back uh, at uh, April, which indicates that there has been an increase, particularly in the manufacturing sector, not in the retail sector, not in the construction sector, but in the manufacturing sector, which I very warmly welcome. And it's about building on those sectors uh, that can bring growth to Northern Ireland, and in particular to look to new export markets. We must very much be in an export-driven um, uh, growth situation, and of course to continue uh, to increase the amount of research and development money that is spent in Northern Ireland. That ends the period for listed questions. We will now move on to topical questions. The first question on the list has been withdrawn. And I call Ms. Rosalie McCorley. 
Uh, can I ask the, the Minister um, for her analysis of the potential impact on the local economy of a British exit from the, e from the EU? Well, it is a potential exit, as she knows, uh, because we are at a very early stage of negotiations and the Prime Minister is currently engaged in discussing issues with other members of the European Union. So I think it's rather early to be talking about an exit from the European Union when the negotiations have just begun. Ms. McCarley for supplementary. I'll ask and call you. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, well, can I ask the Minister uh, if she could commit to providing a risk assessment in that event of the impact of the in-out referendum on the local economy? Well, I'm not quite sure how one could provide a, a risk assessment uh, in relation to a part of a member state. Um, when it's the member state that, that's, that is negotiating in relation um, to the um, uh, negotiations that are going on uh, around the European Union and what needs to change in relation to the European Union. We are part of the United Kingdom, it's a member state and therefore negotiations take place at that level. Call Mr David Hillage for a topical question. Thank you Mr Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister comment on the latest Ulster Bank uh, PMI which was released last week? Yes, absolutely. The Ulster Bank PMI indicates that, uh, as has been indicated by a previous question of the following uh, a disappointing start uh, to the year that the private sector has reported a significant improvement to business conditions with firms reporting the fastest uh, rate of growth uh, in business activities and new orders in seven months uh, and I think that is uh, significant. Uh, furthermore, firms have continued to increase their staffing levels at a faster rate uh, than the long-term average prior to the downturn. So those are very encouraging signs for the Northern Ireland economy. Well, Mr. Hildage, for supplement. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank the, the Minister for her answer so far. With the potential for further cuts in the public sector, does the Minister accept that the argument has never been stronger for rebalancing the Northern Ireland economy by uh, supporting more jobs in the private sector? Well, this is the other side of public sector reform. Um, Mr. Deputy Speaker, it is uh, important that we proceed with public sector reform, but on the other side, we have to ensure uh, that the rebalancing occurs. In other words, that there are jobs available if indeed uh, those civil servants decide that they want to go into the job market. I know that others may have uh, other uh, plans for their future. Some of them may want to start their own business, and some of them may simply want uh, to retire, but for those who want to seek a job, we need to ensure that we continue to grow uh, the private sector. And as this House knows, Invest Northern Ireland had a record year uh, last year in terms of job promotion. And I was delighted to see uh, uh, the Enterprise Minister announce today 80 new jobs uh, at Global Point for RLC. That is a, a very significant announcement, and I'm delighted to see those happening at Global Point. Mr. Peter Weir for a topical question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister for her assessment of what impact she sees uh, the statement of the Chancellor of the Exchequer last week in the House of Commons uh, having for Northern Ireland? Well, as most of the uh, members are aware, at the 4th of June, George uh, Osborne announced £4.5 billion of measures uh, designed to reduce the public debt uh, in this financial year, that's 1516. Uh, 1.5 billion uh, related to the sale of the government stake in Royal Mail, with the remaining 3 billion coming from departmental savings uh, in Whitehall. Uh, the outworkings of the Barnett formula means that the Northern Ireland resource Dell will be reduced by 33 million and the capital Dell by some 5 million. Mr. Weir, for supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for a response uh, so far. Does the Minister expect further significant cuts to be announced in July? Well, I think we are all uh, well aware and indeed are reminded uh, on numerous occasions by members across the way that uh, the Chancellor is to make uh, budgetary announcements on the 8th of July. We, of course, have no specific input uh, to those announcements and the Executive's budget will be impacted again uh, by the Barnett formula adjustments. Uh, I would say, of course, that that is more reason as to why we should put in place our own budget at this time so that we have a definitive budget in place before that 8th of, budget 8th of July budget announcement comes. Scotland and Wales have their budgets in place and I often hear people uh, talk about we should get together with Scotland and Wales and we should go to the Westminster government and push them 
uh, and that's fine, we can do that in relation to 16, 17, 17, 18, but we must have a budget in place for 15, 16, and as yet we don't have that uh, for Northern Ireland. And uh, I think if we are to be taken seriously in relation to other matters, then we need to get that budget in place. Well, Mr. Jonathan Craig for a topical question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, given the previous answer, does the Minister still believe that we are in a position to set our own corporation tax? Well, I do, um, because that was part of the Stormont House Agreement. And as I've said many times uh, during this question time, the Stormont House Agreement uh, was a very balanced document, uh, and part of that was to allow us to proceed with corporation tax. To be fair to Her Majesty's Government, they have brought forward the bill in relation to corporation tax. It has received royal assent, and therefore it is now a matter for us as to whether we want to proceed in relation to what would be an incredibly useful tool for Northern Ireland. Mr Craig, for supplementary. Uh, does the Minister also believe that we should be looking to devolve further powers in particular, I'm thinking about the air passenger duty for short haul flights. Well, I can understand the frustration uh, that is expressed um, by uh, the number of our airports in relation to air passenger duty. I share that frustration. But it is something that I believe should happen. The reduction of air passenger duty should happen at a UK wide level because it's not just Northern Ireland's airports that are struggling as a result of air passenger duty. Other regional airports also suffer uh, as a result of the imposition of this very unfair tax as far as I am concerned. And I think we do need to continue, and I will continue uh, in my role as Finance Minister, to push Treasury in relation to the reduction of air passenger duty at a UK wide level. I call Mr. Leslie Cree for a topical question. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, I wonder could you define for the House the difference between the three categories of expenditure inescapable, high priority, and ministerial priority? And I think I know where this is uh, coming from, having had a conversation with one of my colleagues at lunchtime. Um, inescapable means, as far as I'm concerned, that we are contractually committed to it. So, an example of an inescapable pressure from my previous days in enterprise trade and investment uh, would be a, a signed letter of offer to a company. We have contractually committed to that company that we're going to uh, uh, give them that money to allow them to grow, and therefore that to me is an inescapable pressure. We are legally obliged to provide that. Um, a ministerial priority, um, which has not a contractual obligation behind it, is not an inescapable pressure as far as I'm concerned. It may be uh, very much a priority of that particular minister, but it is not an inescapable pressure as far as I'm concerned. Mr. Cree for supplement. I thank the minister for that clarification. I hope it is used by all ministers. Minister, bearing in mind that, what is your best estimate of the likely resource and capital that will be returned as reduced requirements in the gene monitoring? Well, I'm just uh, currently going through the reduced requirements in June monitoring, uh, and all I will say to the member is it's not going to take me very long. I call Mr. Trevor Clark for topic. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Speaker. And can I ask the Minister, I'm, I'm sure she's aware of the good announcement last week in relation to the coal into London Dairy Line, but can I, the Minister, outline the House what role her department had in relation to this contract? Well, as the uh, the member knows in his capacity as chairman of the DRD committee, uh, DRD announced the award of the contract for phase two of the upgrade of the London Dairy Coal Rain Railway Line on the, the 2nd of June um, of last year. And uh, there were some difficulties in and around that. Uh, there were some errors made uh, in terms of the original cost estimates for the project. Uh, following receipt of the tenders for the work and confirmation of the revised costs, uh, I give approval for it to proceed because the DRD Minister did have to issue a direction in terms of uh, going ahead with the work. I do think it's tremendously good news uh, for the people who live along that line and who use that service because we will be able to have hourly services between Coleraine and Londonderry and I think that that is something that the citizens of that area and indeed the many tourists that go to that area will very much welcome. Well, Mr Clark for supplementary. 
Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. And can I thank the Minister for that answer? And, I mean, indeed, I welcome it. The Committee themselves did visit that area in relation to the particular line whilst they were awaiting the long-awaited announcement in relation to that. However, given that it's, that it's ranged from that £20 million to £46 million, Minister, are you content that the Minister then will be able to live within his budget means? Well, of course, I can't guarantee that any minister will live within uh, their budget means. All I can do is monitor the situation uh, and to uh, give advice and assistance where I can um, to any particular minister. But certainly, uh, the case was made to me that this was something worth doing. Uh, I agree with that. I think it is something worth doing, and I very much hope that it benefits the region. Mr. Alex Easton for a topical question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Chair. Could I ask the Minister, can the Minister give us an update on the development of the Peace 4 programme? The draft Peace 4 programme was submitted to the European Commission on the 22nd of September of 2014, and that was in line with our regulatory deadline. Uh, the Commission has provided formal comments on the draft programme, um, mostly requests for clarification, and officials are working. Uh, to address those, and when that work is complete, the executive will consider the final draft programme and, subject to Commission approval, I uh, anticipate that the programme will be open for applications in late uh, 2015. Call Mr. Easton for supplementary. Could I thank the Minister for her answer so far? Could I ask the Minister when will the new programme be open for applications for youth projects? Well, I'm hoping that the general applications uh, will be open uh, uh, late on in this year. He's right to talk about youth projects because that forms a very key element of the new Peace 4 uh, programme. We are, of course, uh, delighted that there will be a Peace 4 programme. I think a lot of hard work has gone into ensuring that we do have a Peace 4 programme. It will certainly bring additional benefit. Uh, to Northern Ireland and indeed to the Republic of Ireland, uh, and we very much welcome the fact that the Peace 4 programme will be rolling out, hopefully, at the end of this year. Call Mr. Jimmy Spratford, topical question. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister if she update the House on the development of the Northern Ireland Investment uh, Fund? Well, as the member knows, um, we've had uh, conversations around this. Uh, I'm keen to ensure that the executive does everything it can to support investment in infrastructure and that local project promoters have uh, access to affordable project uh, finance. Uh, and as, uh, because of that, uh, we have put in place the Northern Ireland Investment Fund, which is still at an early stage. Uh, but I do hope that it will leave her in additional funding as well, and that will help to boost investment uh, and promote uh, economic growth in Northern Ireland. Call Mr. Spratt for supplement. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, could I ask the Minister to further uh, tell the House how uh, and what kind of projects uh, the fund will actually uh, invest in? Well, at the moment, uh, the Executive has commissioned a feasibility study and. Uh, the reason for that is to try and find out the optimal uh, scale uh, and uh, indeed structure and investment strategy of the proposed fund. Uh, Deloitte have been appointed to advance this study and so they will look uh, to see where they would be best to focus on in terms of the Northern Ireland Investment Fund. And there will be many uh, opportunities uh, to bring forward uh, investment uh, projects. And I do hope that the private sector, as well as the public sector, becomes engaged in this feasibility study so that we can make sure that we have the right mix uh, moving forward for the benefit of the whole of Northern Ireland. Question 10 has been withdrawn. And as the next period for questions does not begin until 2.45, I suggest the House takes its ease until then. <laughs>